fresh New Zealand seafood. There's simply nothing quite like it. They're the old oyster. Take them out. Boys want to eat them for tea. Eating raw NZ mussels. Best mussels in the world. These are like Ferraris. They grow fast. They taste great. They have a, a life cycle that's not too complicated. They're just perfect farmed fish. It's so good, it's being pitched as the next big thing. The government sees the aquaculture industry, which employs about 3,000 people mainly in the regions, as a good bet. Low emissions protein with huge international market potential. And that means big fish farms in the open ocean. And we're not talking a little area, we're talking a massive thing. We're talking sort of 720,000 fish. But some of these plans aren't getting across the line. Kaitahu, of course, they wanted to build a salmon farm off the coast of, of Stewart Island. It would have been 2,500 hectares, two to six kilometres off the coast. This one was declined. The environmental risks here are too great. It can be a difficult balance. I think offshore aquaculture has promise uh, if it's in the right place and done well, but that can be done badly as well. So we need to get it right. Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen, and today on The Detail, the government has a goal to transform New Zealand's aquaculture industry from a $600 million a year sector to a behemoth worth $3 billion a year. But how do we juggle the need to diversify our economy and create jobs with the potential environmental impacts? We take a closer look at the outcomes of two recent fish farm applications and how we can do aquaculture the right way. First, last month a resource consent was granted for a 300 hectare fish farm in the Hauraki Gulf, about 13.5 kilometres from Coromandel Town and 11 kilometres from Waiheke Island. RNZ's Farah Hancock explains what it's all about. That area has been specified as being suitable for marine farming and there's been an application to do a massive farm there. It's sort of five blocks of open sea finfish farms. So they're talking about having 36 pens of kingfish farmed and then the rest of it would be mussels and uh, seaweed and sponges. So that application was put in by Pare Hauraki Kaimawana. Pare Hauraki Kaimawana represents the commercial fishing interests of 12 iwi in the rohe. And it's just been through a resource consent hearing and got approved with some conditions attached. There are over a hundred special conditions covering things like noise, lighting and how to deal with marine life in the area. And it's a pretty large scale operation. I mean we're not talking a little area, we're talking a massive thing. So we were talking about 36 pens, each pen is sort of 53 metres in diameter and I couldn't find the actual stocking numbers, but similar size pens in Australia, they have about 20,000 fish in them. So when we're talking, when this one is fully operational, we're talking sort of 720,000 fish. It's, it will be large. You can't see it from the shore, so you'll never, it'll never really be a, a blight on your visuals, but it is, it's a big operation. What do Parahauraki Kamawana see as the benefits for this? Well, it gives them a chance to make some money, basically, which is, you know, would be great. They're talking about $135 million per annum and saying that there's 452 direct or indirect full-time jobs that'll be generated as a result of the project. But there's also some pretty ardent opposition to this. Obviously, there are environmental concerns. So the further attempts, which sort of leads into where this is, is already struggling. It's had, it's got lots of inputs coming in from the farmland, you know, and from people. So the water quality there isn't great. Obviously, this is a bit further out, but there are concerns that you're adding more nutrients. The problem is with fish farming is you've got to feed these fish in a very, very confined area. So you pump all these pallets in and the food that they don't eat drops to the bottom and then they also pose. So you get these really concentrated spots of uneaten food and fish poo and that can impact the water quality. And also you've got to think about this. This is public space. So you've got people, companies, putting farms in what was a public area, so the public are losing access to what was public space. So should we really think about this as like a sheep and beef farm, but on the sea? Yes, absolutely, sheep and beef farm on the sea. Mark Dalder is a senior political reporter at Newsroom. 
He's written about an expert panel's recent decision to decline an application from Naitahu Seafood for a massive open ocean salmon farm. So they wanted to build a salmon farm off the coast of of Stewart Island. It would have been 2,500 hectares, two to six kilometers off the coast. It would have been a large uh, rectangular uh, salmon farm. Basically, you'd raise salmon and uh, out in the open ocean, but in pens, um, and then you'd be able to sell them. The the newness here was how far out to sea it was, and um, and raising the, the these salmon in in sort of a, a novel environment, which allows you to get much greater scale for your farm than something that's more inland. They were able to get a a slot in the fast track consenting process, which was created during COVID-19 to help sort of accelerate big infrastructure projects uh, through the consenting process, make it take less time. But uh, unlike most of the projects that have gone through that track, um, this one was declined. The expert panel that reviewed it basically said, look, the, the environmental risks here are too great. The panel did acknowledge it would have had enormous benefits for the iwi, Stewart Island and the wider Southland region, creating jobs and generating hundreds of millions of dollars for the economy. But they concluded... We really haven't done this sort of thing in New Zealand before. We're not really confident in the, the management plans that you're, you're proposing here to, to make sure to limit the environmental impact. And we're not really certain this is the right place for it, given that Stewart Island is is quite an important site for for marine biodiversity. As you say, the environmental effects could have been quite damaging. I mean, what could have been impacted? So there were a range of sort of environmental um, concerns that were raised uh, during the process. So these ranged from uh, biosecurity risks like uh, importing diseases to bluff oysters, which are located quite uh, closely to there. There were also uh, concerns around uh, marine predators, that's dolphins and seals in particular. Basically, the farm would have had nets underneath to protect the the salmon from being eaten by predators. Makes sense. But those nets also mean that some of our more vulnerable predators could get entangled in them and drown. Um, We know that's happened on inshore fish farms in the past. There have been 10 dolphin entanglements between 1987 and 2018. And just between 2014 and 2019, there were 17 fur seals that were drowned or had to be euthanized after these uh, net entanglements. Basically, the, the concern was actually you have a much bigger area here. You're in the open ocean, which is much more suitable for these um, animals. And, and we know that fur seals in particular uh, do live on Stewart Island. And so they couldn't quantify the exact risk here, but they thought it was probably likely to be higher than what's already reported from existing salmon farming operations, uh, which is, uh, you know, quite concerning. The, the Department of Conservation said that for a sea lion, um, if even a single one uh, was killed in, in this sort of scenario, that could have uh, a significant effect on the local uh, population. Um, seabirds, people kind of understand seabirds. There are uh, threatened species that have very small local populations in the area, including hoi ho, which is uh, yellow-eyed penguins, fenua ho, diving petrel, and three different species of shag. Uh, and basically, kind of like the dolphins and the seals, uh, there were concerns around them getting potentially entangled in some of the netting. There were also concerns around uh, the food supply for these animals changing in the area. They took all that into account. They found that the effects were more than minor and said, Nah, and in the end, that they couldn't recommend the project go, go ahead. The panel did say, look, because this is a new area, it would be helpful to have some guidance on how to be, uh, how to consider these sorts of projects in the future, and that there needs to be some regulatory change. Because I think everyone's agreed that we'd like to do some open ocean aquaculture, that there are opportunities here, but it's just about striking that balance right and making sure that we're able to uh, appropriately uh, deal with the environmental impacts. We asked Kai Tahu for an interview, but didn't get a response. Remember, all this is happening as the government tries to get its aquaculture strategy off the ground. The aim, to make it a $3 billion a year industry by 2035. That's just 12 years away. It is ambitious, and and the aim is basically, you know, there's an acknowledgement that New Zealand has a lot of this resource, uh, you know, ocean area. Um, that we are quite good at, at fishing and uh, uh, agricultural and, and primary industry sort of innovation. There are other countries that do aquaculture already. You know, Japan farms seaweed. Um, Scandinavian countries do open ocean fish farming quite a bit. Uh, and so, you know, this is actually an area that we have an opportunity here to, to 
build it up. It's lower carbon in many ways than the other forms of protein that we produce, your beef, your your lamb. And it also can sometimes be a bit more climate resilient compared to inshore fish farms where marine heat waves uh, a couple of years ago devastated the New Zealand King salmon farms that they um, are closing some of their farms. They lost um, many thousands of tonnes of fish. Record numbers of salmon have died in the Marlborough Sounds after a long hot summer caused sea temperatures to rise. Whereas in the open ocean, the temperatures are a bit cooler. So you've got some climate resilience there, particularly as you know that the world is going to keep warming for a bit. And so we want to make sure that whatever investments we're making are are future-proofed. All right. And this strategy came out in... 2018, I believe. 2018. Okay. So how much progress has it made since then? I think it would be fair to say it's made some progress, but not as much as the advocates would would want it to. There's still sort of open questions here around the degree uh, uh, to which sort of our our consenting processes and and regulatory frameworks are enabling for aquaculture. You know, I think those are sorts of the sorts of things that need to change if you really do want to get to that, um, you know, mass scale uh, industry. Well, that's the thing, like big fish farms that would help meet this ambition, like the one we're talking about near Stewart Island, are being declined. They are. And and, and so I think it's not inherently a problem uh, for something to be declined. You know, here it, it seems the panel's laid out so, some good reasons as to why this is not the right location for it. It really is about the right farm in the right place, and there are right places for it. It's just about finding them. But you then also want to make sure that you actually have a relatively speedy consent process. So so Kaita, who did get the advantage of going through the fast track process, which is quite useful, but it's not a process that's by default available to um, aquaculture projects. And so there's uh, work underway to try and figure out how do we make sure that, that consenting is not a barrier to aquaculture, that it, it, it does the appropriate environmental checks, but we're not just sort of tossing a bunch of red tape around um, just to stop things from being done because we can. Anywhere that, you know, we've seen things happen and, you know, aquaculture growing in New Zealand? There are um, places. So the, the New Zealand King Salmon Farm is moving out into the Cook Strait is uh, my understanding. For us, Blue Endeavour's the next step in our evolution. It's going to be New Zealand's first open ocean finfish aquaculture farm, and it will pave the way for our industry. Is it seen as an alternative to beef and sheep farming? I mean, that's what New Zealand's known for. Um, Are we trying to make something a little bit more sustainable here? I think uh, I wouldn't necessarily view it as an alternative, but more as an addition, as a, a thought about Here's a new way that we can um, do farming, basically, that we can farm protein. You know, a $3 billion industry by 2035 when livestock right now are worth $30 billion, probably more than that, you know, 10 times what we've got. It's clear that you're not planning to to propose at all. We replace all of our, our sheep and all of our cows with salmon and mussels and oysters. But, um, you know, we've got climate change on the horizon, both the impacts of it and the the need to decarbonize and the need to lower our emissions. And so when you're looking for ways to grow your primary industries, you don't want to just be investing into the same old intensive dairying. Uh, You want to be finding new ways, new places for that money to go. And I think aquaculture is is one of those examples of a, a new industry where the money could be put to something that's more sort of productive from an environmental and climate sense, uh, as well as an economic sense. There are also efforts to change how we do our livestock farming as well, to be more emissions friendly. Um, So it's not like we're going to get to the end of the century and do only fish farming and have no cows and no sheep. But maybe we've got a bit more diversity there that that we're not just sort of... um, Uh, putting all of our um, caviar in one basket, so to speak. But aquaculture can be really valuable for the space it uses. I mean, my understanding is like a hectare salmon farm can be worth $140 million each year, which is huge. Is that different to beef and sheep? Yeah, it's one of those things where it is hugely more valuable um, and therefore uh, hugely more valuable for the space it takes up and, and sometimes potentially for the investment that's put into it. We've now got this kind of balance that we've got to meet between coming more climate friendly, being more sustainable, but also trying to make sure that we don't treat the environment badly. Yeah, I mean, I think that that this actually is a there's a slight tension there sometimes between our green sort of development from a climate perspective and protecting the environment as well. And so it's important not to say 
actually you, you, you have to pick a climate or environment. That's not the case. We can do both. Uh, it's just about making sure that we're thoughtful about both in all of our decisions so that when we're making our decisions on decarbonizing, we're also making sure that we're taking account of uh, indigenous biodiversity needs and that when we're making our decisions about biodiversity protection, we're not walling off our ability to respond to climate change. How can we find this balance? Raywin Pert is a policy director for the Environmental Defence Society. She wrote a big report on aquaculture several years ago and says while there are benefits to be had, New Zealand needs to up its game to do it well. When I did my work, which was some years ago now, I thought that our, our approach to managing aquaculture was quite undeveloped. And I think that's still the case. You know, we now have a lot of good guidance. So the uh, Ministry for Primary Industry, you know, produces good guidance on siting considerations, ecological criteria, and also managing biosecurity. But we lack you know, the legal framework to actually um, apply a lot of that, you know, really good thinking. And I think, you know, things like biosecurity, our marine biosecurity framework is very rudimentary, you know, and often a very slow response to incursions, um, biosecurity threats. And we've just seen that recently in the Hauraki Gulf with the Kalupa incursion that's now been there two years. Biosecurity New Zealand plans to take immediate action against a pest seaweed discovered around Kowo Island in the Hodaki Gulf. We haven't seen an effective response and it's now getting away on us. So, you know, we need a much more robust um, approach to biosecurity, particularly if we're going to farm indigenous finfish species, because that's when, you know, you have very significant risks. And, you know, currently it's all, you know, pretty much on a, a, a sort of a voluntary basis. So I think we do need a lot more rigour um, well, yeah, tell in this me, industry. Yeah, t- tell <laughs> me some of the good and the bad things that we've seen from overseas. So if you don't get it right, things can go badly wrong. And in, you know, countries like Scotland and um, and uh, Tasmania and even Norway, where they're, they've got very large scale uh, fin fish farming, I mean, there's been enormous problems with lice, with disease, with biosecurity issues, you know, um, mass fish die-offs, enormous expense in having to treat fish <laughs> to keep them healthy. Um, and really an acknowledgement that if you have, you know, overstock areas, you're going to have real problems. Now, we haven't yet fished um, indigenous uh, fin fish species in New Zealand. So we um, we farm salmon, but that's an introduced species. So when we brought salmon and it didn't come with all the associated parasites and diseases. Um, if we start farming things like kingfish, well, they will, all those um, indigenous uh, diseases and things like lice will be in our waters. So you're looking at a completely different challenge in terms of um, both managing the health of the, the farm species, but also potentially if you're um, generating disease within farms that can affect the wild population. So it's a, you know it's a very different sort of scale of issues you need to manage. So who's doing it well overseas? When you look overseas, you can um, pick up good approaches from a range of countries. It's um, everyone's facing challenges, but I think there's some highlights like in Norway, um, which has probably got one of the most sort of sophisticated regimes. They they have, I think, two notable things we need to learn from. One is that they actually charge a lot of money to issue a license um, to occupy that that common marine space. So we're talking about millions of dollars. And that money's going into a fund, you know, for the benefit of the public. So the government's making sure that the public is directly benefiting financially from the use of that space by the industry. We don't charge, um, we don't have a proper charging regime here for use of that marine space and we need to have it. And I think the second lesson from Norway is that they're much more flexible about those licenses. They can be moved around the coast. So when environmental conditions go, you know, are unfavourable, like we've seen in the Marlborough Sounds with sea level warming and we've seen mass die-offs of salmon, well, before that happens, you actually move those farms somewhere else. So you have other areas that are already consented, and, and the kind of license that you've issued is a is a mobile li- license, if you like. So you're not applying that kind of fixed approach that we have on land that you have a bit of space and that's you know that's where you farm. You know we need to be thinking more flexibly that that you have a license to farm you know a certain amount of seafood, but that license could be moved um, according to the environmental conditions. So if people said to you, it's just going to be a big farm, but out at sea, 
and it's just going to cause a lot of damage. How would you respond to that? Well, this can be a very good industry, I think, for the country if we do it well and put it in the right place. And I think offshore aquaculture has promise uh, if it's in the right place and done well, but that can be done badly as well. So we need to get it right. And then I think it can be a, you know, a very positive thing. We approached the industry body, Aquaculture New Zealand, for an interview for this podcast, but no one was available. We also contacted some companies in the sector, but they either said no or had no one available. That's it for today. I'm Tom Kitchen. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by Phil Bench. Our producers are Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to Farah Hancock, Mark Dalda and Raymond Pert. Kakitiaro.